Whether we are there or not, ITSP Magazine still gets the best stories. Plenty of conferences and events spark our curiosity and allow us to start conversations with some of the world's brightest minds. In person or virtually, Sean Martin and Marco Cipelli go on location and sit down with them at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Together, we discover what the synergy of these three elements means for the future of humanity. ThreatLocker is a zero-trust endpoint protection platform, providing enterprise-level cybersecurity to organizations globally. With ThreatLocker, you only allow only what you need and block everything else, including ransomware. Learn more at ThreatLocker.com. <laughs> Did you push play? I did. Well, record. Play. Let's play the record. <laughs> All right, sound check again. Sound check. Do, 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 do. Perfect. Yeah. Right, we're rolling. Yeah, I don't get better at this. <laughs> That's cool. We don't, we don't prepare. No. <laughs> All right, you want yeah. to get under your arm? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this is why I always accept talking to these guys. Yeah, there's no it's script. It's organized chaos. Is what exactly, <laughs> or <laughs> trying to make a, yeah. there is a, 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 a system to the madness, right? Yeah, right. for sure. All right. So is that part of this? I are we, think are we roll it already? <laughs> I have no idea. I feel like my life is on, uh, on record anyway. I know, we're always recording. Yeah? Always recording. Well, we're, we're here at uh, the AISA CyberCon event in Melbourne. I think we just call it ASA, though. ASA? Yeah, no one calls it AISA. I call just it AISA. Just ASA. No. Don't be no. that guy, Sean. No, yeah. just get, it, get into it. Get into it. Don't it's be been ASA guy. since the beginning of time. All right, see? Yeah. That's why I'm here, to learn. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, learn. that's important. That's my, that's my learning of the day. <laughs> yeah. We had a good chat with JJ. I learned a bunch of stuff from her, too, which oh, is really good. cool. But ASA, here we go. Yeah. ASA, AU CyberCon in Melbourne. Well, you're, one of the, you're one of the first members of I ASA. am. I am. What, what does that mean? I, what, um, what is that? What's that? Wow. Well, who, who are you, first off? So <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> I don't know. Janan um, Budge, our good so friend Janan, from Forrester. Janan Budge, yeah. Vice President at Forrester Research. I lead our security and risk research in Asia Pacific. And globally, I'm spearheading a lot of our research on what we're now calling human-centered security, mm -hmm. which includes uh, all manner of things such as human risk management, awareness, behavior, culture, but also very importantly, the culture of security teams themselves, uh, leadership issues impacting CISOs, the future of the CISO, uh, so on and so forth. It's uh, the world is my oyster, I think, with that uh, with that particular topic. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I do a sub-series, uh, Human-Centered Cybersecurity, with yeah. Julie Haney. I don't know if you've seen that. No. Subseries. She's from NIST, and we we look specifically the research of the human element connected yeah. to cyber. Yeah. So maybe you'll be a guest on our. Yeah. You know, years Absolutely. ago when I started working in cybersecurity with Sean, I was talking about the human element a lot, and nobody yeah. listened to me. Yeah. <laughs> and now <laughs> everybody's say. just talking about the human element. But I'm, I'm like, well, sure thank you, thank you. The first time I interviewed with both of you was when I first joined Forestry. It was at RSA and in San Francisco, and I think we talked about security culture at the yeah, time. Yeah, for sure. And I remember I published my first report on security culture, and you know, one of the things we measure at Forestry is readership and it completely bombed completely and I remember mm. doing this recon and asking our clients well, what's, what's wrong with that I thought it was a great report they were like no it's great but the word culture like uh. <laughs> we, we updated it to talk about uh, the human firewall and readership just uh, shot through the roof so culture people even seven years ago was so taboo uh, but you know, didn't let that stop me. I <laughs> kept on going. No, no, we gotta uh, get we've going. Now, we've now killed the human firewall terminology for for lots of different reasons. Uh, because I think the not I think I know that the space has progressed and it mm. needed to have progressed. And we are uh, we say the future is now, and uh, you know, but the future really was a long time ago. We're finally finally starting to move there. 
yep. in the human-centered. So back to my first question. Thank yes. you for all of that. Yes. One of the first members of yep. ASA. Yeah. Yeah, what I think is, I've mean? got my badge. So um, ASA started out, I'm sure someone would have given you the history, as the Information Security Group. And it was just a, a bunch of well-meaning cybersecurity citizens. There was about 20 of them. They got together and said, hey, this security thing is becoming quite a thing. This was 25 years ago. And we're all going to get together and create a community of practice. I wasn't part of that. I was the next generation that came in, um, I think, five years after. But we, I think I remember number 71 or 77. I've got the ASA badge with my membership nice. number on it. <laughs> It was adorable and I was in Sydney at the time and we used to have, we, we started doing events, uh, I want to say such as this one, but they looked nothing like this one. We mm -hmm. just got the community together and topics that were hot at the time and finding amazing speakers and then I ended up moving from the Sydney Organising Committee to be on the board of what then became ASA. And my job was to grow the organization. I think we ended up at the time, by the time I left my tenure there, we grew the organization to 600 members. And we thought that was amazing. So to look at it now, um, I don't know, 15 years later, and to see what what is today is pretty incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. It was just such a, an unheard of thing, security back at the time, right. if you all remember, 25 years ago. And in Australia, it was such a nascent thing. Mm -hmm. I remember going into meetings, into the, what we called the member meetings, and I would be literally one of the only women that would walk into a room of 200 people. And my other, my other friend and I would just link each other's arms and just, it was terrifying as a mm. young person coming into this industry. Interesting. Sad that we have to think about that. Mm. But, but, but uh, I want to thank you for doing that work then. Yeah. Because it led us to this moment. I mean, nearly, uh, I think around 5,500 people or so at the conference yes. this yeah. year. I can't remember how many speakers there are, but yeah. uh, tons of great topics, tons yeah. of great work taking place. We're meeting a lot of people we get to see. Yeah. I don't want to say old friends. Yes. Long time long friend, standing. Long standing. Yeah. Friends. <laughs> but um, so y you've seen a lot of change. Yeah. I don't know if you want to look at uh, Australia specifically or the greater APJ, APAC region. Um, or, the, or the greater world. Or the greater world. What, what are some of the things you've seen progress over the last few years so. and, and some things that haven't as yeah, well perhaps yeah. there's yeah, um, why not? I mean what has really progressed is how elevated cyber security has become in organizations of boards everywhere I know that's stating the blatantly obvious but it really that has been a progression that I never expected in my career you know I remember when I first joined cyber security I joined a, a team called Electronic Data Processing Audit. That was the beginning, which then evolved to information security. So it's had, it's mm -hmm. had lots of different names. It wasn't always cybersecurity, obviously. Um, so board level attention, citizen attention, we're starting to really understand the impact of cybersecurity on citizens. With that comes the, uh, the much deeper understanding and in Australia, we're just beginning that understanding of the impact of geopolitics and geopolitical risks on all of us. You know, this is no longer some kind of a back office function mm -hmm. where you hire a security manager as a tick in the box. And that is definitely an evolution that I've seen. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's not a security dude or do debt anymore, although it was never a do debt, it was always a security dude. This is a, a business level function that is entrusted with building trust for the organization. That's quite significant. Right. Yeah. You it is. And, and you know, look at, looking back, when we started ITSP magazine, you know, there was the idea of looking at society, cybersecurity. Yes. Then we added technology. Yes. Because you can't have technology without cybersecurity. Yeah. Or at least 
you shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yeah. And you shouldn't not have technology without thinking about the consequences for society. Yeah. And that now it's all together, it could be a culture. So yeah. maybe it was a scary word years ago, but yeah. now that's what it's about, is become part of who we are. And, uh, and I think it's part of the investment on the business side, it's about making operational, but also worrying about the future of our kids and our society and, and how we live our life. Yep, yep. And I still don't know, you know, it's so interesting. I love, I love the, the intersection of people, society, mm. technology. I don't think just as yet we know well enough about how our actions as security leaders in organisations have impact on the whole of society yeah and i think for me that is a commitment for myself for, for my next year's research agenda what is the CISO's role hmm. if at all any in ensuring cyber security cyber safety of society i know we each do it for our own organizations and um or at least we say we do but i think that values led human centered knowing that humans are at the center of every single thing that we do in cyber security including the impact of society and so on no so i'm going to rip the human element out of this for a second yes well, thanks please <laughs> that's what i like. always want to count on you on that i know do it so a couple things that i that i've heard over the last number of months um, a lot of focus on small medium business yes so we mentioned the CISO we mentioned board yeah those two things don't always well maybe the board but they don't always apply to s the smaller businesses yeah they don't have cybersecurity teams they may or may not have IT yeah which may or may not provide cyber services yeah. as part of the IT services yeah. um, your view on that that part of the, the ecosystem. ecosystem of yeah. delivering capabilities to society yeah. and in there because the, the supply chain there's been a lot at least in the US a lot of talk about supply chain which yep. these third party or these smaller organizations are third parties as part of the bigger, yeah. bigger picture so some of your views on that space that completely that, that underrepresented <laughs> completely <laughs> underrepresented yeah. including by myself as well mm -hmm. so I talk I serve enterprise clients right. uh, and I don't my coverage isn't so focused on supply chain issues, but I think just generally in cybersecurity, we are completely um, not paying enough attention to that particular situation. Our national cybersecurity strategy that was published last year has got significant focus in Australia on small to medium businesses, and I really welcome that. In terms of what is happening in practice though, I don't, I don't know, but I don't think that there is enough happening. Right. Because I know I've been looking at third-party risk management yes. for a long time. Yes. Um, personally. Yeah. And to me, it's it's a culture. So I'm going to bring the yeah the human. Oh, you're element. bringing it back. I'm bringing it back. Yeah. Now. Because it, it is a culture. It is yeah. people understanding their role within the ecosystem. Yeah. Is do you think? that it's an enterprise driven thing? Do you think the enterprise has the op opportunity to extend their understanding of cybersecurity and risk management to their third party partners? Uh, and, and, yeah. and, and government's role perhaps in, in that? In terms I, I of don't know that it's just an opportunity. I think it's an obligation, right? Yeah. It's, a, it's an obligation. It's, and again, extending this focus that cybersecurity, it's not just about the, the immediate team, the immediate technology, it extends well, well beyond ourselves. And the more we can understand about those whom we serve, those that whom we are connected with, and how everything is interconnected, the better we all will be. Yeah. So, from a global perspective, you know, you have different culture, again, I like yes. that word. Yeah. And, and, and a different involvement for political reason. Yeah. On, on how much it's driven by regulation, how much the government get involved. Um, I know Australia has a pretty deep involvement of the government in kind of leading 
the way for small medium business, I believe, and which so is on. very recent. It well, hasn't always right. Done so yeah, some other country they're not even there yet. The yeah. European Community maybe yeah. a little bit more hands on after the GDPR. Yeah. So. Um, well, you can already answer my question. We're yeah. not there yet. No, we, we're not there <laughs> yet. And it's so important, you know, you asked before about uh, what perspectives do I have on mm. Asia Pacific yeah. as a region. And I it's just sometimes like when my vendors ask me questions, when my multinational corporations ask me questions, it's really difficult to even call APJ or Asia mm. Pacific, whatever you call it. A region. There are so many different mm -hmm. uh, regulations, cultures, languages, business practices. When I run roundtables or keynotes in each of the countries in um, in Asia Pacific, mm -hmm. it is incredible how different and how diverse they are. So I was in Indonesia um, a few months ago, and it was just remarkable to see some of the issues that are impacting them. They had their first ever Data Protection Act. Mm -hmm. So the CISOs there who were, were probably more like what we called CISOs in Australia 15 years ago, and maybe in the US 25 years ago. So they were you know, still developing um, their management, their leadership, their business skills. So they were spending all of their time actually responding to the new Data Protection Act and doing a series of um, compliance related activities, which to me was quite remarkable considering what I think some of the, the threats in that particular region are. So uh, Indonesia is one of the most popular, populous countries on earth. They've had democratic elections. The uh, impact and the potential for misinformation, disinformation campaigns is huge in that particular country. And we've still got regulations that are coming up to speed, business cultures that are coming up to speed, security practices that are coming up to speed. It's really interesting. Um, and then how we all operate and how we can all support the different uh, geographies and practices. I think it's going to mm -hmm. be really important. Mm -hmm. Having uh, built products and then even more importantly, bringing them to market, mm -hmm. I'm always having uh, uh, an argument in my head of, is the market ready for certain yes. things? Yep. And I see this changing all over uh, different regions as well. Um, data protection might be important. Yep. Um, AI security is a, a topic that seems to get a lot of attention, maybe some investments. Yep. Um, but that work's still a thing. Do we focus enough there? Yep. Um, SIM, I don't know. There's lots of technologies and categories. And I guess my question is, how do you see the vendors responding to these changes of what do we build? <sighs> is the market ready for what we've built? Is, is there money available to buy the stuff that we built? <laughs> and and it's so, so I am very deeply covering what we're now calling the human risk management market mm -hmm. at Forrester globally. Uh, it was security awareness and training. In February this year, we made the, the call to yeah. transition that to human <coughs> risk management, which is almost an entirely updated mindset and technological shift from the olden day security awareness and training solutions really really cool disruption is happening particularly coming out of the uk the nordics mm. and the us how are the vendors responding in australia um <coughs> i don't know do we even exist here mm. i know some of the big ones operate here but they will operate here under their mm. traditional security legacy security awareness and training not the updated capabilities um, are they in asia pacific Nope, mm. there is not enough money to be made there. So the right. vendors are chasing not what society needs, not what industry needs. And I don't want to say this generally, but generally mm. that is what's happening. And I can completely understand it in some ways, but in other ways it's like, come on, you, you could actually make so much more mm. money if you focus on what people need mm. rather than your immediate you know, what's going to make you money at the end of this year. Right. And that's been, at least in the market that I cover, that's been mm -hmm. very, very disappointing because Asia Pacific <coughs> is completely underserved yeah. in more um, innovative technologies and solutions. So 
I've seen some posts on social media, so I want to get your perspective on this. Yes. Around security awareness training mm -hmm. and some, I don't know where the data came from, but there's some chatter on LinkedIn that it's not working. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if that's what you are seeing, that it's not achieving whatever success was defined as, or it's achieving what it's was designed to do, but not what it really should do, maybe yeah. to your point. Y yeah. Or it, the future is coming and, and we just need to kind of hold on and see where things are going to really achieve what we want it to. Yeah. So I don't know, so your thoughts on where, where yeah. we stand with So they're not, the, they're the not thoughts. This is, this is seven years of research right. now that, um, that has led us to this point. Um, one of the things, so in 2022, we published the Future of Security Awareness and Training. After research that we did on the, the regulations and frameworks that ask organizations around the world to do security awareness and training. And we, we discovered many things that I think are potentially the root cause of the lack of effectiveness of security awareness and training as we knew it. One of them is when we looked, we, we actually examined 45. And by we, I mean one of my poor researchers, <coughs> his name is Kevin, unfortunately no longer with us, not my fault. Uh, but he went through 45 of these things. And we, we know looked, why then. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was pr it was a pretty tough research project for the poor guy. Uh, and I'll always be grateful mm. to him. But we looked across those 45 and we looked at the purpose of the control of security awareness and training. And the purpose was to make people aware, to train them. <coughs> the word behavior change was mentioned zero times in mm -hmm. all 45. The word culture, zero times. Mm -hmm. And that to me was a, it was a red flag. It's like we're training people, why? Have we all forgotten why we're training people? We also looked at the dates that these things were published and 17 of them were published over a decade ago. Uh, a lot of them, most of them were, uh, not most of them, a lot of them were also published over two decades ago before iPhones were invented. Mm. So this is not cool. We are trying to solve a prop an, an old problem, but one that is really changing, particularly with the advancement of AI right. technology <coughs> in a really old way. So we, we can't do that, we just can't do it. Then when you ask people, how do you measure the effectiveness of security awareness and training? What are you doing? And I have done this myself, by the way. So this is zero <coughs> criticism of all of us. I have been there. We measure effectiveness, according to this study, uh, by completion rates. How many people <coughs> have completed their mm. training mm. program? And that's kind of the equivalent of saying, ah, Janan has read all of the books on diet and she is now thin and beautiful and fit. It's like, it's not how it works. Reading something and behavior <coughs> change, they're very different things. Or how many hours do you have flying a plane? For example, yeah. <laughs> all no, of those things. But no tests completed. Yeah. <laughs> and then when I receive briefings from some vendors, and this was in the early days, and I'm looking at their uh, awareness and training things, and I'm like, this isn't effective. They're like, what do you mean? People gave it 4.85 stars. And it's like, but we're not, we're not in the business of well, entertainment. Well, I think the, the, the issue is, are you memorizing or are you actually understanding? Uh -huh. Correct. Right? Are they changing <coughs> behavior? Exactly. So they, they were the original um, things that we put forward. And, we, and, and at the same time, I started talking to some smaller startups. And we were very fortunate at Forrester at the time that I was able to include startups in my evaluative mm. research. And so I did because the startups were showing me this thing and I'm like, what is this amazing technology? What is it doing? Mm. It didn't have a name and it was so different from just <coughs> training people. So what I started seeing is this technology that would integrate with security solutions to mm. see people's behaviors. So are you, um, Sean, does he, uh, uh, does he use multi-factor authentication? Does he enable his VPN? Does he do all of the good things that we train mm. him on? Uh, if you don't, at that point, then we can intervene via training or via a policy update. Mm. Like, oh my God, this 
is a game changer. So no. we can go from training all of the people on all of the security things that they may or may not care about, that may or may not be relevant to them, mm. to being really contextualized and adaptive in our training. Uh, with loads and loads, hundreds of conversations with my vendor community, with my clients, with end user community, <laughs> we announced then the name of the market, which is human risk management, far from perfect, but it represents mm -hmm. the idea that there is a risk that is posed by and to humans, and that we need to support humans through that risk. And we do so via training them at the right time, the right context for the right person, or sometimes we can support them by intervening via policy change. Mm -hmm. And that is, for me, this is a game changer. Very early infancy, like this is, you know, the in, this is the space <laughs> for uh, innovators and early adopters at the moment, both, both from vendor and enterprise side. Uh, and we expect, four to eight years time that evolves to then what we are terming adaptive people protection, yeah. which is the idea that the concept, this amazing idea that technology, people, processes all come together to protect humans with minimal or no effort <coughs> on their part. That was um, a lot. Uh, and that's good next. <laughs> That, that connect with the first conversation we had today with JJ. Yeah. You know, 10 things that, 10 skills you need to have that nothing to do with technology in order to be cyber secure. And, and she used the, the, the reference to training, teaching kids how to behave on the road. And then finally they get the, the driver license, they go around, but they've been on the road for a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can't expect somebody to just learn no. everything in one shot. No. Have you guys done a security awareness and training course? I still do them every year and I <coughs> fail all the time. I've got two university degrees. I've got all my security qualifications. I work in this space and I've failed them. <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I cannot. Yeah. That's crazy. Uh, we expect too much from people maybe. Yeah. I, we absolutely do. And I used, to, I used to walk around repeating in organizations that I'd worked at and security teams that I'd led. Security is everyone's responsibility. I'm taking that back and that, that has been very controversial in the community because of course it is, that's how you build a culture. I'm not saying kill that, but let's just be a little bit more reasonable on our expectations yeah. of people's role in this. <coughs> Let me ask you this. Talk to me. My general view of the relationship between vendors and enterprise is vendors are innovators and they bring new technologies mm. and they try to fit it into an organization. Yeah. Where I've seen, and back in the day I built Semantic Sim. Yeah. And I connected with some organizations that were trying to build their own. Yeah. And that that understanding of what they were trying to build yeah. connected to what I was trying to build helped me build something better. Yeah. But, and I don't, you, I don't know if you know Laz, but Laz was at Sears. Uh, uh, Lazaricus Demetrius was at Sears. He was a CISO there, built basically a, an enterprise grade sim that fit his culture, yeah. fit his operations. <laughs> yeah. Nothing I could build a semantic would do that and also serve the rest of the market. Yeah. So, my question to you is do you hear from enterprises programs that work for them with human risk management in mind that perhaps vendors? can't meet unless it's a bespoke thing or are there innovations that you're hearing that that support a culture for the enterprise <coughs> that might apply to a broader for me human risk system. management is the it, it's highly adaptive to the people it's serving and to the organizations it's serving where i think one of the downfalls of security awareness and training is it's not and it had to be highly customized if that makes sense yeah. whereas when you're adapting everything to every single <laughs> individual based on their risk profile the risk they're exposed to exposing themselves to exposing the organization to that's a game changer and then it becomes a little bit less about the it becomes actually 100 percent about the needs of the organization and then the individuals mm -hmm. Because the example I'm thinking as we're, as we're talking here is yeah. there's security you can layer on top, there's security yeah. you can shim in, 
there's security you can put on the back end to catch stuff and then there's within the HR system within the workflow there's security right and that's yeah. or within yeah. finance or within yeah. product development or within sale or whatever the marketing yeah and so I guess my point is that almost that the business applications need to have security awareness training yeah in there yep awareness and training or, or security aware, awareness there. security and awareness yeah. so when when behavior is not matching yeah. the policy yeah. it's within the yeah, process absolutely yeah and wouldn't it be amazing if it happens at the right time <laughs> right. at the point of behavior right. so we see that in email it's yes to some degree yes we but do do we see it anywhere else yeah not yet. Not yet. <laughs> no, no, not yet. So and that's and that's okay. and we will. We will start seeing that. We'll start seeing. It. We see that sometimes in DLP, okay. uh, in data. So you know, you're yeah. sending yourself a, an email to your email account, uh, but you know, you've got to think when it comes to humans. So we, we're writing research with my mm -hmm. colleague Jess Byrne. I don't know if you've spoken to her ever. Mm -hmm. She's amazing. Um, but we're writing research on deconstructing human element breaches. What do you think of when you think of human element breaches? Somebody click on something that yep. is not supposed mm -hmm. to click and fill yep. up a form or whatever. Yep. Anything else? Uh, I just think generally data exposure. But yeah. 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 It's really interesting. So we most people think of social engineering, right. phishing, clicking links, the human error sometimes. So you expose data and you have right. data exposure. We. And certainly when you look at things like the, the DBIR or mm -hmm. the in Australia, the Office of Information uh, Commissioner, they release a, an annual breach notifiable breach report. Uh, human element breaches are defined differently by ANISA, OAIC, DBIR. <coughs> and you know that percentage, 64% of breaches are related to the human element, 98%. I have been incorrectly misquoted as saying something like 90% of human element. It's like, oh my God, where are you getting these figures? And I suspected that there's a lot more to human element breaches mm -hmm. than just uh, clicking on links. And, and lo and behold, we're about to publish that research early next year. We have created the wheel of human element breaches. There are eight categories. One of them is social engineering. One of them is human error. But there's uh, six others, including the way that currently humans can misuse generative AI, for example, mm -hmm. by entering sure. PII in chat GPT, including um, humans being targeted with deep fake, small information, misinformation, and several like, insider yeah, risks. Manipulation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is the problem and it's a sizable problem and it's one that we don't we don't really know how deep it is, how broad it is. And we really need to, before we start diving to solution, we've <coughs> got to anchor ourselves in the problem. So uh, from all these it, it almost, and, and you, you went there, I mean, even you, Sean, talking now. Like, it's almost looked like the training should start the moment that you get into the business environment. Now we need to teach people how not to click on email, not to do things. But then I go back to, it's not just when you're studying for the car, it should come from much earlier, from an education that it becomes a culture before you even go into the working environment. Because, I mean, the, the human element risk is in your life as well, is in your family, it is in your personal life. It will and nobody is teaching to kids in school yeah. hygiene, cyber hygiene, and not to do certain things. And who is up that too? So what I'm saying is maybe if people will come a little bit more prepared before entering the workforce, I'm not going to say it's going to be easy, but easier, maybe. Or maybe if we if we coach people as they go through life. Yeah, exactly. When they're making decisions that are less than optimal. Yeah. There's always going to be room for proactive education, communication, but as you're making, and I'll give you, I'll give you an example, and I'm going to be delivering this mm -hmm. at our keynote in, uh, in Baltimore in a couple of weeks time. Um, so I have a, I have a, an issue with sleeping. I haven't slept for a decade and you know and I've tried I've tried reading all of the books about sleeping. 
Am I better slept? No. I invested in a continuous glucose monitor that showed the relationship between glucose spikes, sleeping, that whole data-driven approach to showing you exactly what behaviors you need to change mm. in order to achieve goal. Game changer for mm. me. And in the keynote, I talk about the example of my husband who love him to pieces, but he's so annoying sometimes. And one of his most annoying traits, he sleeps for nine and a half hours every bloody night. He was once in Japan and he slept through an earthquake in Tokyo. I'm I, I can not do joking that. you. I can do that. But imagine, yes, well, bless you. But imagine if we gave you and my husband a book about sleeping when what you really need mm. or what he needs is a book on how to be a less annoying husband. <laughs> and that's then... Oh, that sounds like my wife. And that, mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> and that then becomes the data-driven conversation, right? Do you see mm. the difference? But what we're doing in security, we're right. giving everybody books on sleeping. Not everybody needs the Not same everybody thing. everybody exactly. needs to learn to sleep. Some people are exhibit amazing mm. cyber safety <laughs> behavior. We do not need to train these people on all the things all the time. Mm -hmm. And how do you know who is exhibiting cyber safe <coughs> behavior and who's not? Human risk management. You do so by integrating, by understanding the entirety of the person's identity, the person's behavior, mm. the person's susceptibility to exposure, and the person's knowledge of cybersecurity. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Mm. Absolutely. Like I mean, I, I had a conversation about, about the educational system. Yeah. With the use of technology to become yeah. more targeted according to the need of the kids in the class. It's, Not everybody needs exactly to learn like the same thing yeah. the same way. In the same way. It's the same thing. In the same we way. just assume that everybody is yeah. at this level mm. yeah. and that's what we teach. Correct. And when you look, <coughs> when then this is when I get excited. So human <laughs> risk management is right now, like we're still mm. just in the education pieces. Mm -hmm. like, you know, you need pictures, I need to explain to you. But where the vendors are at, where the disruption is at, they're now starting to be able to correlate people's behaviors, but also mm. how they're responding to different interventions. So you, Marco, are you going to be better if I give you a two-hour training course or just a little nudge and a coach mm. or to leave you alone? What's going to work better for you? Yep which is exactly what you're saying about in the classroom. It's like different people have different yep. learning needs. That is so cool. Yep. Imagine scaling that in the old security awareness and yeah. training. And imagine that coming up on a personal level by a behavioral yes. study, maybe through AI. And yep. so my iPhone is going to tell me, hey, that yep. don't, don't, don't click on That's that. That's human risk or, management. Yep. That's it. That yep. is, or on the computer. Or, yeah. yeah. Yeah, hey, did you mean to send everybody that file yeah. titled <laughs> redundancy or, yes. you know, could you, yeah, was that, was that on purpose? Yeah. Um, hmm. I have so many questions. It's <laughs> such an exciting, it's I such love, an exciting I love it because feature. it's really the convergence of understanding the human psyche. Yeah. And, and doing it technologically. Using technology mm -hmm. for what yeah. can be yeah. improving yeah. our humanity, yes. right? An extension of our capabilities yeah. and not either fighting it or leveling. I, I love this. I love yeah. where you're going with this. Yes. Well, not where it's where the it's where the market needs to go. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you asked some really interesting questions before about, well, you know, vendors are should vendors push this on enterprise? Mm -hmm. And I'm of the view that vendors do need to push a little bit harder actually. Mm -hmm. So in we've just published the evaluation of human risk management, the nine vendors that matter the most. Uh, I think that was two months ago. And one of the one of the things that really came out is okay, so we've innovated, we've just spent two years, the vendors have innovated, they've got these shiny new products that we're still educating the market on, it's really exciting. But where rubber is going to hit the fan is how are they going to help enterprise mm. adopt? Um, how are they going to help convince enterprise that actually, can you, can you just stop doing this the old way? There is a better new way. Um, and I, I do think that is the responsibility of vendors, which some vendors uh, vehemently disagree with me on. They're like, oh, but our clients aren't asking us for this. <laughs> and I don't, it's, 
Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's true. They're not asking us for this. Mm. I don't know where the budget is going to come no, from. No, it's not no, the right. security awareness and training team. We'll figure it out because yeah. we need this. I'm sorry, but the market sometimes doesn't ask for the better things. No, no, it wants faster horses. <laughs> exactly. It does, and yeah. it's really, yeah, you know, exactly. it's, uh, it's difficult for them, though. I'm sitting mm. here in a privileged position of being an analyst. I don't have to make money out of a product. I don't have to make some of these go-to-market decisions mm -hmm. that they're making. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, I would love to see us do better. Yeah. Yep, and I think with that, I know we're gonna have to wrap. I have yeah. questions yeah. all around uh -huh. the well, well, CISO's we'll responsibility. Have her, we'll we'll have Jinan yeah. back again. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, my there's technology. Class. We can connect with her even when you're, we're not here. Yeah. Although it is very nice yeah. to be here. It is. Yeah. It is so in nice person. to be. It's so good to be in person. <laughs> yeah. It's so I good. Know. Yeah. Well, you're invited back. Thank uh, you. I'll try to remember all the questions in my head. We'll, we'll yeah. bring those up again. We didn't even touch on burnout or any of the. Uh. I mean, I want to say cool we'll stuff, but no. We'll, <laughs> no. we'll do a follow-up. Yeah. We'll do a follow-up. You're yeah. welcome anytime, as you know, but we'll yeah. make it a point to uh, get yeah. something on the calendar. Thank and you. And we'll keep this conversation going. For now, that's uh, that's it for us here uh, with Jinan, anyway, uh, mm -hmm. from AU CyberCon. Thanks for uh, joining us here, listening, watching. Please do share and subscribe. Stay tuned for more. ThreatLocker is a zero-trust endpoint protection platform, providing enterprise-level cybersecurity to organizations globally. With ThreatLocker, you only allow only what you need and block everything else, including ransomware. Learn more at ThreatLocker.com. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Sean and Marco's On Location event coverage conversations. Please take a moment to give the show a good rating and leave a comment. Remember to share this podcast with your friends, family, and colleagues. Come back for more conversations and follow Sean Martin and Marco Cipelli as they continue their journey toward redefining cybersecurity and society.